Second Peter 2, I'm going to read, starting at verse 4. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Peter tells us here that Lot was a righteous man. Peter tells us that Lot living in Sodom was vexed with the filthy behavior, deportment of the wicked. The word conversation here in the Old English didn't mean talking. It meant how you conducted your life or your behavior. He tells us that Lot's righteous soul was vexed from day to day with the unlawful deeds of those he lived among in Sodom. So I think it is reasonable for me to say that in Peter's opinion, <clears throat> and I believe Peter was inspired, so in God's view, Lot was a righteous man. But let's look at <clears throat> Lot's life and see if we can understand a little bit more about this righteous man. I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 13. And I'm picking up at verse 7. I think most of us know the, the context of this. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees and he came, Lot was his, his nephew. And Lot came with him. And both of them, they had a lot of possessions, a lot of property. They were wealthy people. They had a lot of possession. And verse 7 of Genesis 13 says here, There was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee. The uncle said to his nephew, let there be no strife between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren, we are family, so let's not have strife among us. And he says, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. It's time for us to split, because our possessions are great, and the people who are managing our possessions are having conflicts in managing our possessions. So it's time for us to split. So separate from me. And if you will take the left hand, I will go to the right. Or if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Here is the uncle telling his nephew, you take your pick. Whatever you decide to do, I will do the opposite so we will not have conflict among us. And I must pause to say this, you know, brethren. I must pause to say this. This was the senior man, the uncle. He could have said to Lot, listen, I am going to take this part and you can take the other part. And humanly speaking, that's what most people in the seniority, in the senior position, the position of greater authority would do. They will select what's better for them and say to the, to the junior person, you take the rest. But I'll tell this, I'll say this to us, we ought to be ready and willing at all times to give, to let others have the benefit of the doubt, to let them choose what they want, not because you have the authority or the power to do something, it means you should, 
it's always good to yield your power, your authority, your right for the sake of peace and love. Verse 10 says, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. So Lot looks and he sees that there is a very nice fertile valley. And you would have thought that the junior man would have said to his uncle, Uncle, you take that place. It looks very good. You're the older man. You are the senior man. You take that place because it looks like you'll do well down there. But no. Lot chose the plain of Jordan and started heading off in that direction. Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves one from the other. Lot started heading off towards Sodom. But Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Sometimes the choices we make in life are colored by what we think is good for us. We like to choose the best. There are some people who when you give them choices, they want the best thing because they think that's what's good for them. Lot chose what he thought was best for him. And see, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. But verse 13 says, The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Did, God, did, did Lot know this? The Bible doesn't say. I don't know. But Lot made a choice. And instead of pitching his tent toward his uncle, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. He turned in that direction. So, so when his uncle gave him the choice, he started heading towards Sodom, and then he went there and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He, he's camping out outside of Sodom now, looking in the direction of Sodom. Going over to Genesis chapter 14. I'm going to verse 12. Remember we just read a while ago that the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly. Now, over here in Genesis 14, Sodom came under attack and some kings captured some of the things. And verse 11 says, They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So, so quickly Lot had moved from pitching his tent towards Sodom to dwelling in Sodom to the extent that these kings could have captured him. He was captured. And his goods, his possessions, and they, they went away with it. The, the story tells us that Abraham, when he heard about it, when he heard that his nephew was captured, he gathered his servants together and he went and he, he slaughtered the people and he rescued his brother and took him back, his son, his nephew, sorry, and took him back. And of course, Lot went back to living in Sodom. The choices we make in life, brothers and sisters, the choices we make in life, we have to be careful, we have to think carefully. But here, he saw what happened, Abraham rescued him, took him back, and he continued to dwell in Sodom. The next we're going to see of Lot is in Genesis chapter 19. There are other things in between, and you can read the entire story of different things there. But, but we come to Genesis 19 here. In verse 1, it says, There came two angels to Sodom at evening. And we'll remember that before that, the angels... The three men came to Abraham, and Abraham pleaded with them and said, If we find 50 men, will you still destroy Sodom? You know, Abraham knew that his nephew was living there. And I believe Abraham was negotiating to try to rescue Lot. And when he said, If you find 50, will you spare the city? And, and they said, Okay, if we find 50, we'll spare the city. And then Abraham came down, If we find 40, will you spare the city? And he came right down to 10. 
And Abraham probably figured that, okay, if they spare the city for ten righteous men, certainly there, could, there should be at least ten in there. Because Lot and his family, and maybe the people who Lot's family interact with, certainly he could probably find ten. Well, we know the truth. They didn't find ten. Couldn't even find five, actually. But here come the angels now. They have come to destroy Sodom. They have come to, to read out the closing rites of Sodom. And it says, Lot sat in the gate at Sodom. So, at this, what it means to sit in the gate in those days, the elders of the city would sit in the gate. They were the men who were in high position. Lot had come to Sodom. He had taken his possessions to Sodom. And he was a wealthy man. And perhaps because of that, and maybe he was a sensible man too, the city has, had elevated Lot to an elder status. So he was now sitting in the gate at Sodom. He was an elder. And Lot, seeing them as a statesman, as an elder, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. In those days, it was the proper and polite thing to do for the senior people, the elders of the city, or a house or wherever, to greet strangers and treat them well. And so Lot greeted them as an elder of Sodom. So far, it's not a pretty picture, brethren. So far, it's not a pretty picture, but Peter says Lot was a righteous man. We know the story very well. In chapter 19 here, when the angels, when the angels tried to plead with Lot in verse, well, Lot took them, Lot took them to his house, and we know the story. The men came and well, at first the angels didn't want to go in. They said, we'll stay in the city. But Lot, knowing what the city was like, so he knew what his, um, his, his fellow citizens were like. And he pressed upon them and said, no, come and stay in the house. Come and stay in the house. And he took them in the house and made a feast. And they baked and ate. But before they lay down, verse 4 says, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house both old and young all the people from every quarter they called unto lot and said unto him where are the men which came into thee this night bring them out unto us that we may know them you would think these these this was a very hospitable city they wanted to know these men to make friends with them and make acquaintance with them but we know the truth of that they wanted to know these men as Adam knew Eve, his wife. This was a city that was steeped in sin, aberration, sexual aberrations. And they saw two strange men come in and they wanted to come and have immoral, sec illicit sexual relationships with these strange men. They said, bring them unto us that we may know them. Lot stepped outside. Lot is an elder. Lot is a senior man in there. And he steps outside and closes the door behind them. And he said, brethren, please. See what he calls them? Brethren. Lot is considering these sinners to be his brethren. His brothers. He said, brethren, do not so wickedly. Listen what's next. Behold, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me bring them unto you and do to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. You think about this. You think about this. We talked this morning about a father, a father who sh should think of the protection of his family to such an extent. And here is this father willing to give his two virgin daughters to this mob for them to do as they please because he wanted to protect these two men. A noble effort to want to protect the two men. A noble effort 
but the extent to which he had sunk that he was willing to give his daughters to them doesn't speak well for Lot at all. He was willing to give his daughters to this mob to be raped. Moving on, they said, stand back. And they say, you come to sojourn with us. You're a stranger here. You are not from these parts. You came here and you're now going to be a judge among us. We will deal worse with you than with them. And they were coming upon him to damage him. And they came near the door, but the two men put forth their hand, grabbed him inside and shut the door. And they were beating at the door. I guess they had strong doors there. They were trying to, to beat down the door. But, but the, the, the angels smote them with blindness, so they couldn't see what they were doing. Perhaps Lot knew that these were men of God, these were angels. Whatever, whatever the situation at this time, the men said to Lot, listen, we've got to hurry now. We've got to hurry. Do you have anybody inside here? Your son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whatsoever you have in this place, bring them out of this place, for we are going to destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Brethren, I pause a little because I look at the condition of the world around me today, and it's not much different from what I'm reading about here. It's not much different. And God was ready to destroy Sodom because it had become such an abomination on the face of the earth. And we are told by Jesus that when the end of the world is coming, it's going to be as it was in the days of Lot. And we see it happening. We see that people are proud. <laughs> they call it pride. They even use the name. They are proud to be abominations, to be abominable. And you dare not speak to them because they will destroy you as they sought to destroy Lot. Anyway, short of it, Lot had other daughters. He went and tried to plead with them. They were married to the men of Sodom. And he tried to plead with them to come because the place was going to, dis to be destroyed. But the, the, the daughters didn't heed him. And the sons-in-law, Lot seemed as one that mocked. He, they took him for a joke. And when the morning arose, verse 15, and the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. They are saying, hurry and get out, or this, this, this conflagration is going to get you. And verse 16 says, while he lingered, Lot was lingering. But Lot was a righteous man, Peter says. But everything so far I can find fault with and wonder why Lot was doing these things. Lot lingered, and the men laid hold on his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hand of his two daughters, being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him outside the city. So he had to be taken out by force. This righteous man had to be taken out by force. Brothers and sisters, how many of us righteous people today, God is going to have to use force to extricate you from the systems of the world? How many of us? How many of us are so deeply embedded in the system that is around us that even when we see things happening, even when we see the heavens falling, even when we see the abomination all around us, we are still hesitating, still lingering, waiting for the angels to take our hands to drag us out of the city. Of course, you know what that meant. What that meant is that all Lot's possessions had to be left behind. Lot was a rich man when he came to Sodom. He was elevated to the state of elder, a statesman. But no, the city was to be destroyed and God spared him. But his possessions 
were lost. Angel said to him, listen, go, escape for your life. Don't look behind. Don't stay in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And listen to Lot again. Lot said unto them, oh, not so, my Lord. Imagine, imagine. Be, he is now still bargaining and pleading for something else after they're saving his skin. He says, behold, now your servant has found grace in your sight. And though you have magnified your mercy, which you have shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Man, this was a righteous man. This was a righteous man. He's, he, he, he is afraid to do what the angel says he should do, because he's afraid that some evil may overtake him. And he died. So he pleased with him. There's a little city nearby. Let me go there instead. And my soul shall live. And the angel said unto him, Okay, I'm going to let you go there. Have, I've accepted thee concerning this thing also. That I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. So every step of the way, Lot was making mistakes in my humble view and I'm sure most of you will, will agree with me. So was this a righteous man? Peter said that he was and Peter was under inspiration when he said that Lot, Lot made many missteps. So I want to put it to you and I want you to understand from this brothers and sisters that you're not righteous because of how good you are. You are not righteous because of how many good things you do. You are not righteous because you can do what God says you must do. You are only righteous because Christ is your righteousness. You are only righteous, I am going to repeat it. You can only be righteous when Christ is your righteousness. The Bible tells me that Lot was a righteous man, but when I see his behavior here, I call it into question. But the Bible says he was a righteous man. It says that he was living there and it vexed his righteous soul when he saw what was going on, but he didn't have the strength. He did not have the fortitude. He did not have the courage. He was too entangled with the system that existed he made mistakes he pitched to he looked towards Sodom he moved towards Sodom he pitched his tent towards Sodom he went to live in Sodom and he became an elder in Sodom there are some people in our society today who have climbed up so high in society that they can't pull themselves from it I don't tell you that God is going to come and grab your hands and take you out I don't know some may perish. Lot's daughters who were married to the men of Sodom perished with it. Lot's own wife who was taken out with him perished because her heart, I, well, I shouldn't say it because the Bible doesn't say it, but my, my speculation is that though she came out physically, she did not leave Sodom emotionally nor spiritually she was too deeply wrapped up in the system of Sodom, in the lifestyle of Sodom, in the possessions that she had in Sodom, that she never left Sodom. And there are some people, yes, you may be living in a house with a righteous person. You may be going to church with righteous people. You may be talking the language of righteous people. You may be wearing the clothes of righteous people, but your heart is not surrendered to God. Your heart is surrendered to the systems of the world. And those systems, they are going to hold you. The tentacles are going to bind you so that even if God were to take you out physically, you would become the pillar of salt. But I want to look at the positive side of this. And I'm going to read a few verses of scripture. I know that you probably have thoughts and ideas you want to share. But I want to read a few verses of scripture. 
Um, the first one is in Romans chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 3 to 5. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It is not what you do that makes you righteous. It is not the work that you can do. Oh, you can go and, go and, 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 and give out um, money to people. You can give out gifts. You can take the people to the hospital, heal the sick, all these things. Those are not the things that make you righteous. It is when you believe on him that justifies the ungodly. That's when that faith is counted for righteousness. I believe Lot believed in God and had confidence in God. It, the evidence for me is that when those men came, Lot could identify that these were men of God and he sought to protect them and take him into his house. His heart was in the right place. And that is why it's not for us to judge people because man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Romans 10 and verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's talking about people who are trying to, to be righteous. They're thinking that, oh well, if I look at these Ten Commandments and I can abide by them, I am righteous. Or if I can pay my tithe every week or month or whatever. Or if I can do all these things that the Bible says, I'm going to be a righteous person. No. That's self-righteousness. Going about to establish your own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of God. For verse 4 says, Christ is the end, the objective, the aim of the law for righteousness, to bring righteousness to everyone that believeth. It is in Christ that righteousness resides. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God made righteousness to give to us because we could never ever achieve or attain unto righteousness. So God created righteousness in his son. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. We have that privilege of being the righteousness of God. In Christ. In Christ. Righteousness is only in Christ. It is not in your actions. You, you know, you know, every one of us, when I look back at my life as a youngster, I've done so many, so many stupid, foolish, sinful, ugly things. Just this week I was driving and my memory went back to years and years ago, something that I did. And I felt so revolted by it, and I wished that I could get it out of my system. But I thank God that that's not what he's checking upon. He's not checking upon the things you did or didn't do. He's finding out if you have given yourself to Christ if you are in Christ because if you are in Christ then you are made the righteousness of God praise him Philippians chapter 3 let me start from verse 7 but what things were gain to me those I counted loss for Christ amen brothers and sisters there is nothing in this world that is worth giving up Christ for. There is nothing in this world that is worth giving up Christ for. Give up everything for Christ. 
Paul says, I count all those as loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. When Paul knew what he was talking about, Paul was up there too. Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. He could speak 25 different languages at least. Paul was a, a, a respectable man in the Jewish hierarchy. That's why he was selected to be the one to go around and to wipe out that despicable set of people known as the Christians till he met Jesus. And he gave up everything. His money, his possessions, his status. He gave it all up. Compare Lot, who clung to it until he had to leave it behind. But Paul, when he met Jesus, he gave it all up. Verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Be found where? Be found in him, in Christ. That's where we ought to be. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Self-righteousness is of the law. Your own righteousness, any righteousness that anybody can try to achieve, it has to be working by the law. But Paul says, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Man, what precious promises God has given to us. What precious hope. Final verse, Titus chapter 3, and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness. It's repeating the same thought, really. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That is how we are saved. That is how we achieve righteousness. So Lot. Lot, in his heart, I have to believe because the Bible tells me Lot was a righteous man. I don't see his works. I don't see any good works to commend Lot. But the Bible says he was a righteous man. And that he was not happy in Sodom. And all that commends Lot for righteousness has to be that according to the knowledge and faith that he had, he was committed to God. Now Romans 8 verse 28 tells us, well-known verse, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his promise. I want to, to point out something to you. I want to point out that after Lot went to that little city, it happens that the conflagration spread abroad and it was threatening to come near that little town that he went to and so he eventually went up into the hills. And the Bible tells us that when he went up into the hills, him and his two daughters, now he didn't have a wife either, and the two daughters said, you know, it's just us and our father up here and we're all going to perish because there's nobody to carry on the generations. And so they, they got him drunk and they got pregnant for him. Very bad situation. Very bad situation coming out from making wrong choices in life. That no, this incestuous relationship brought forth children. And the children of that incestuous relationship were Moab and Ammon, the Ammonites and the Moabites. And you, you read, when you read the history of Israel, you can see that those two nations, Moab and Ammon, were like a thorn in the flesh of Israel throughout the time. So, 
missteps leading to missteps leading to this and then the very the very nations became thorn in Israel's flesh but I want to point out something out of one of these two out of the Moabites came forth the kinsman redeemer so the kinsman redeemer is Jesus and he came from that Ruth was a Moabitess and so out of the Moabites came Ruth who was the one to, to bring on the kinsman redeemer the one who would eventually be the redeemer came right out of the Moabites so so even though it was a bad relationship even though it was a bad situation God Romans 8 28 all things work together for good and God was able to bring the redeemer even out of out of Moab let's put it that way so we see how God is able to bring a clean thing out of an unclean and it is why God is not interested in what you can do in your efforts in your attempts at being righteous God is not interested in that because you can't his word says that you as a black man cannot change your skin color the leopard cannot change his spots you as a sinner cannot do good that's what the word of God says you don't have it in your power you are not able to and therefore you need the Redeemer you need the one who can make you good make you righteous give you righteousness and so the righteousness of Christ is what we need so brethren know the fight is over the war is over the battle is over Jesus has done it Jesus has won the victory the victory to be able to give us righteousness and you don't have to try to do it you just take it so brothers and sisters the message that I want to leave us with this evening is to look to Jesus is to trust Jesus is to accept it we ought not to be downcast we ought not to be doubtful and skeptical about our righteousness because if you if you believe God and you have surrendered to him then you are righteous you have the righteousness of God in Christ and you are saved and this is what must bolster us on a day-to-day -day basis this is the confidence that we must live with and walk with I am not an ordinary human being I have the righteousness of God in Christ his royal blood flows through my veins and when you know that you know I used to wonder how how those those martyrs could have done it how they could be there on the stakes tied up light fire under their feet and they are singing how they could stand in the arena with the lions rushing at them and they're singing they're not screaming in fear and pain they had the righteousness of God they had the relationship they knew that they were signed sealed and delivered and when you know that nothing shall offend you great peace have they which love thy law it says in the Old Testament here in the psalm and we know what that means love God love the Word of God love the fellowship with God nothing shall offend them what shall separate us from the love of God nothing brethren as we go into the new week may this be our hope our courage our our spirit as we go out and meet people may this be manifested to those we come in contact with from day to day because if you have light the light cannot be hid under a bushel if you have light let it shine 
Let it shine. Let men and women, boys and girls, see that light because they also need the righteousness of God. Thank you for sharing. God bless you all. Amen. 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 Amen.